Hey everyone, I'm Sarah, and today we're continuing our work on the sender test frame in the panel switch. This is part three of a whole video series, so if you're just joining us here, you might want to watch the earlier videos for some background. But here's where we're at right now. The apparatus has been mounted in the frame, and we're ready to start connecting the wire form that I made in an earlier video. Now, this was my first wire form, and I think I did a pretty good job on it, but there's definitely some room for improvement in the next one. Regardless, it's going to work just fine, and most people will never notice the minuscule flaws that I see here. Anyway, let's get the form temporarily attached to a supporting member so that we can start wiring it. It's a pretty standard process of going back and forth between the T-drawing and the wire form and soldering each wire one at a time. The T-drawing shows the wire colors and terminals, and at this point, it's mostly just coloring by numbers. This is actually pretty relaxing for me to do, since there really isn't too much thinking at this stage. I just put on some music and got in the zone for a while. But as I did that, I realized that one of the relays I used was very much the wrong one, which means that I have to remove it and go to our off-site storage to find the correct replacement. If you remember from episode one, I talked about how the parts of this circuit came out of a number one crossbar office in Brooklyn. And the crossbar version of this circuit is pretty close, but there's a few important differences. One of them is that the relays they use are slightly different, and I didn't notice this one before now. And then the mistakes kept coming. I took a closer look at some of the relay's neighbors, and I found that one of them was actually missing the contact material at the end of the springs. Check it out. See the end of the relay springs closest to the camera here? There should totally be a little spot of contact metal here, but it looks like it's totally missing. Here, you can see that it's actually present on the top spring pair. Anyway, we've got to fix that, because without that spot of contact metal, these relays just aren't going to close their circuit reliably. This is actually a convenient excuse to break out the contact welder and have a little fun. Now, this is not a thing you want to mess around with unless you kind of know what you're doing, because there's a pretty good chance you could mess up a relay even more by using it wrong. The official documentation even warns you to practice on a spare relay first before trying this for real. But I've done this before, so I think we'll be able to fix this with no problem. The contact welder plugs into AC power and has a special button that operates the welder for exactly the correct amount of time to complete a weld without actually damaging the relay spring. The business end of the welder is these pliers here. They can accept different phenolic inserts that are sized for particular types of relay springs. The inserts help you align the welder so that the contact always gets attached in the correct place for whichever relay you're trying to weld. The contacts themselves come in these handy little trays. You remove the contacts from the tray with a pair of tweezers and then insert them into tiny slots in the jaws of the welder. This holds them in place relative to the phenolic guide card, so when you place the pliers around the relay spring, the contact is aligned perfectly. Then, when you're ready to weld, you just squeeze the pliers, hold your breath, and press the button with your other hand. See? All fixed. After that, I just had to adjust the springs so that they'd be correctly set up for the nice new contacts to make and break properly. Every telephone switch switch has her very own pair of spring bending tools, and I'm making very good use of them here. Okay, now that I've completed all the wiring and fixed the relay contacts, it's time to start testing. There is no way that I got this right on the first try, so I'm going into this assuming that there will be problems. First basic thing I need to do is make sure that there's battery and ground everywhere that there should be. To do this, I use my clicky headset, which is the single best tool I own. The concept is super simple. If you're searching for a battery, you attach one end of the headset to ground, and then you poke around using the probe until you hear a click in your ear. There's your battery. There's enough resistance in the headset circuit that you don't actually blow fuses unless you accidentally short the probe itself between battery and ground, or you touch a 130 volt lead without noticing it. 
As I was poking around and testing, I realized that I miswired a battery feeder on one of these relays. So just like a string of Christmas lights with one blown bulb, half of the circuit doesn't have any power. Oh well, that's easy enough to fix now that I've spotted it. But then I found a more serious problem. Remember that new relay that I got from storage? That's not working at all. There's battery at one end of the winding, but when I poke the other end with ground, I don't get a click and the relay doesn't operate. That tells me that this winding is open somewhere. That sucks, especially for a relay that was new old stock and still in its original box. Well, at this point, I've got no choice but to move it and try to figure out what's wrong. This is actually pretty annoying because the terminals on this one are wire wrap and wire wrap does not like to be undone. If these were soldered terminals, this would be a piece of cake. Anyway, after much cursing, I got the relay unmounted and onto the table. And would you look at that, open circuit across the winding. But if I test closer to the coil at these points here, I see continuity. Looks like the tiny coil wire is broken somewhere here. The good news is I think I can fix this. All I should have to do is reflow the solder between the coil and the terminal lug that it connects to. Good as new. Okay, let's remount that relay and rewrap all those connections. This is kind of nerve wracking because like I said earlier, wire wrap connections don't like to be messed with. In fact, it's technically against the official bell system rules to do that, but I don't care. I am doing it anyway. I'd rather do that than rerun all of the leads going to this thing. And now it's back to testing. I spent another hour or two bouncing between the drawing and the circuit, making sure that continuity was correct at all points. I was still fairly nervous at this point because I don't have the circuit description for this circuit. A circuit description, or CD, is a document that explains in written form how a circuit is supposed to work. And it's a required part of the documentation for normal circuits. See, the schematic tells you how things are connected, but it's usually very hard to understand how things are expected to work from the schematic alone. Like, yeah, I can figure out how some things work, but it would definitely be nice to have a play-by-play -play exact description of what should be happening at each step of the way. Unfortunately, we don't have a copy of that for this circuit anywhere, so I get to fly by the seat of my pants. And this is where my week turned upside down. So often at the museum, you start with one project with a nice fixed scope. And then before you know it, you're doing something completely different. While I was working on the sender test frame, someone mentioned that the interrupters and the number one crossbar were making a weird noise. And when I went to investigate, I discovered that one of the helical gears on the main vertical shaft had worn itself down so badly that it required immediate repair. Time to drop everything and work on that. In electromechanical switches, the interrupter works as kind of a master clock. Various circuits around the switch need regular pulses to complete some of their functions, such as flashing a lamp, timing for billing, or waiting a certain amount of time for something to happen. And without those clock signals, part of the switch will just fail to work. In panel and number one crossbar circuits, the timings are all pretty bespoke, so there are many interrupters, each driven by their own cam and gear sets. Each cam has a follower wheel that opens and closes these phenolic bars, which in turn open and close their contacts. The particular gear that was worn out was driving the terminating marker time measure function. This is essentially a timeout where if the marker fails to complete its job within a couple of seconds, it will give up and route the call to reorder. Technically, the interrupter was still working, but it was looking so bad that it needed to be fixed sooner rather than later. Add to that, I've been meaning to service these anyway, so what better time than now? The thing about these interrupter gears is that they are incredibly long lasting and generally don't need serious repairs for many, many years. This failure must have been ongoing for a very long time to get this bad. I don't know why I didn't notice it earlier, but I suspect that the gear was so covered with oil and grease 
that I never really got a close look at it. Only problem is that once a gear in the middle of the drive shaft goes bad, there's no way to remove it without removing all the gears above or below it. This is the kind of thing that takes several hours to do since all of the supporting apparatus has to be moved or removed to allow the gears to slip off the drive shaft. Again, this is not normally a problem because these things can go years or decades without needing to be seriously repaired, but when they do, it's kind of a big deal. And once I removed the really worn out gear, we can compare it to a new one that I had in storage and see how really badly it's chewed up. Wow, I'm glad I found that what I did and I will clearly have to keep a closer eye on those adjustments from now on. And now two days later and I have the interrupter situation all fixed up. It's back to probing and trying to make my thing wiggle. Probing it some more, I realized that I transposed some wiring on the top and bottom springs of one of these relays here. This was just a simple mistake because once again, I didn't realize that the relay code on the schematic was different from what I had in real life. So I moved those wires around and... All right, let's see if this is broken or not. Okay, so we're gonna operate this. Nice! Heck yeah, look at it go. Look at it oscillate, yeah. Nice, yes. I have successfully built a thing. I have built a jiggler. Look at it jiggle. Okay, this is great. A major milestone has been reached in bringing this part of the switch back to life, but we're not done yet. The particular wiggler circuit is actually used towards the end of the test sequence, and we still have to build the other wiggler interrupter that's used at the start of the test sequence. That one simulates dial pulses from the customer's telephone, and it's going to be a lot harder to build. So stay tuned for that in the next video, and we'll dive into that one. See you then.